there are many things I've learned in the midst of being single. Being single to me just isn't a bad thing. It's not that being single that's the issue. See, it's that lack of companionship that'll bum you out real quick. You know what I'm saying? If you don't, trust me. Shoot, man. Okay, let me differentiate. See, the lack of companionship is not synonymous with being single and being single is not synonymous with a lack of companionship. Like my daddy tells it, you're single until you're married. However, I can have all the commitment in the world without being in a relationship and thereby be single. And on the flip side, I can be in a monogamous relationship and there be no companionship between us. You get it? No, you will. I mean, being single in a social media world can be interesting. You have your ups, your downs, your lies, your truths. He's fine, but he ain't that fine. Why he's so cute he ain't got no girl? So many questions, so very little answers. Why? Because nobody talks anymore. Nobody opens up. It's all about them. It's all about themselves. It's all about them. Yeah, I know I already said it, but it's all about him. You ain't worried about me, but you want me to get at you? <laughs> no. Raw News No Fluff presents being single in a social media world. Let me rewind a little bit. See, most people think that the lack of companionship is the very definition of being single, and that is so wrong. Being single by yourself in solitude, doing you, not having to check in with somebody, not having to feed somebody, not having to go out with somebody. You can just go out on that dolo tip. That's being single. That's just being by yourself. A hermit of sorts, which... I'll admit I have kind of become. See, I rather enjoy being at home, alone, cooking, recording. Lord, oh, golly, fix it. I probably shouldn't be a hermit right now. I shouldn't be a hermit until I have a cat. And I don't even like cats, so there you go. I just got to get out of here. But I feel like when my peoples come over and we record, you know what I'm saying? It's like, there we go. I have that five or six seconds of company. And then they leave and I'm probably more happy when y'all leave. If I don't hear episode next week, it's because I got jumped by my crew. All right. Oh, and yeah, if you know of any events that I should go to, please DM me on Instagram. It's at Brandy with the YL Grant. See, I need to build my network so I can in turn build my net worth through mutual benefaction. Who wrote this? Is benefaction a word? Y'all always got me saying like some crazy stuff. Look. Y'all not going to keep having me make up these words. I use them in the worstest of ways. Weirdest of ways. Then a faction. I'm going to Google that. And if it's not a word, this crew think they funny. They not. They not. So let me break down this word benefaction. Since y'all think y'all funny. I know what it means because I always make up words. And so I have to be quick with the definitions. I want to meet people that can increase my net work and thereby directly affect the increase in my net worth through collaborations, hence benefaction. Helping each other and learning from one another. That's actually my prayer now. Lord, I want to build my network that will build my net worth. I'm trying to get out to places that are chill, focused, inviting, and collaborative. Amen. Benefaction. And that was your Brandy English Lesson 101. You're welcome. So, I think it's a lack of companionship. And another thing, and this is super random, I have a lot of clothing. I admit it. I don't mind saying it. I do. My closet is well fitted for every occasion. Why? Because I personally believe 1 million percent that I look great in clothes. Like, so good. Like, ooh la la. So, I have a lot of clothes. Don't judge me. Just ask me out on a date so I can wear them. A lot of my clothing items are designed for dates. It's crazy because I'm single, but they're so cute. It's stuff I would want to wear when I go on a date. Or like, we real cute on the town. You know what I'm saying? Like, we real cute on the town, you know? My swag matches his swag. My fly matches his fly. His sexy matches my sexy. His chill matches my chill. And we just doing it together. We looking good, baby. We're like relationship dressing goals for everybody around here. Like, dang, they fly. You right. We are. Do a spin, boo. Do a spin. And bow. Okay, I got distracted with my imagination. She's very active on imagination, she is. But anyway, focus. So there are seven things that I have learned during these three years of singleness. 
I was driving last night and it literally came to me seven whole things, not eight, not six, and I didn't have to fish for seven. They literally just spilled out. I was actually at a gas station pumping gas and I was like, dang, I learned a lot in these three years about being single. So while my gas was pumping, I grabbed a pen that's in my door and a notepad that's usually in like the middle console thing. And I started jotting the seven things down. I jotted the bullet points down, but I didn't jot the notes. So y'all got to bear with me, okay? The first thing is that silence is okay. Being quiet, being still, being reflective, just being to yourself and not having to entertain someone, not listening to the radio, not watching TV or having something going on is beautiful. Check it out. Listen. Wasn't that lovely? It allows you to seriously think, make plans and figure things out. Now on the flip side, that silence can get a little lonely. I admit it. Especially if you refuse to talk to yourself. Hi. My name is Brandy Grant and I refuse to answer my own questions or have a full conversation with myself. Nope, not gonna happen. Uh-uh, nah, I'm good. But seriously, you don't have someone to just jump on the bed and talk to at any point. You don't have someone to laugh with when you think something is funny. But that loneliness can only come if you let it. That loneliness can also motivate you to stop being a hermit and get out, meet people in relationship. And clearly that silence hasn't done that to me yet, but maybe it'll get to that point. But yeah, it allows for a lot of individual reconciling, self-assessment. Reality hits you in the silence because you can't talk your mind away from the facts of real life. In silence, you really find clarity and you have to be strong enough to deal with that reality as it comes. I was with my mommy the other day. We were driving around. I was doing all the talking. All of it. I stopped and I quickly said, mommy, I'm so sorry. She asked for what? And laughing, I said, for talking so much. And she said, I don't have anyone to talk to when I'm at the condo. So when I get around you all, I'm here and I have so much to say. You know, I just got to make sure my voice box still works. And when I said that, she started cracking up. Another, oh goodness, that can be possibly seen as problematic is that when I hang out with a dude, whether it be with someone of interest or just a friend, I don't mind not talking. We can be sitting in the living room and not saying a darn thing. We can drive across country in complete silence and I'd be cool with that. Now I'm down to talk, of course. But not talking to me isn't going to be a way to get under my skin. You shutting up, shoot, you might just be rewarded for that. We can just be. We can just relax in silence. Silence is indeed okay. Especially if you're using that silence for the betterment of you, which I did a lot of. And I'm grateful for the time God gave me to do said thing. The second lesson is that, and these are in no particular order, just the order in which they came to me. I've learned that if I don't know how to or even like to date myself, then why should anyone else? He who likes me will and let them come. See, my heart isn't empty by any means. It just grows to make room for more people. I like me. Shoot, I love me. And I want to be around me, so I date me. I take me to the movies, to dinner, on trips. I eat by candlelight, on Netflix and chill. We really have to learn how to date ourselves. And this time, I have learned how how to date myself. You'll learn a lot about yourself when you do. Am I indecisive when I go to a restaurant? Do I have to talk to someone in the movies? Do I prefer to walk on the inside, away from traffic, or nearer to it? Can I afford to date me? But you gotta be able to recognize and accept these things to determine if they need to change or remain the same. Side note, in dating myself, I realized what type of restaurants and what types of foods I really and truly like. So when he asked me, what do I want to eat? I got places in mind. I got places on deck to choose from. And he can't be mad at the cost because he asked me. And he won't get aggravated because I'm sitting there talking about, oh, I don't know. Do whatever you want. Oh, get whatever you want. You know how guys like to pretend they get upset when we do that stuff, but they really don't because they really wanted to pick anyway. I won't give him that opportunity to get upset or to pick. So ha 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 ha. Take that. Because I've dated myself and I know what Brandy likes. In saying that, you understand the process there because you've been. You've been away, done your due diligence. (laughs) So again, that goes back to, can I afford to date me? Further, if you aren't willing to dress up for yourself, then you're a friggin' fraud, man. The first person you should be cute for is yourself. When I take myself out, oh, Brandy looking fly for Brandy. Trust. Brandy's cute for Brandy. Brandy's worth it. Nah, Brandy not going out in no sweatpants in the tank. Oop, pause. Wait. Yes, I am. Depends on what we're doing. If we're go-karting, then yeah, I might wear some sweats and a tee. Because I love sweats and a tank top. Now, I'm not looking bummy in sweats. I just like being comfortable and cute. Most times, ladies, and this is me pretending like I'm whispering a secret into your ear, we are most attractive to the opposite sex when we are most comfortable, hint, hint, or so I've heard. However, I wear that maybe to a movie. If I'm taking myself to dinner and a movie, I'm going to dress cute. I'll probably wear sweats to the movies because it's dark in the theater and ain't nobody going to see me. 
I ain't trying to be all jazzy. Single guys aren't discovered at the movies. But then again, I've never paid it any attention. So really, I can't say single men don't or can't go to the movies alone. Question, single fellas, do y'all go to the movies alone? Inquiring mind, singular, wants to know. Actually, I did meet a guy in a movie once. I remember it like it was, I don't remember it too much. I just vaguely remember him driving up saying he liked me through his window. Moving along. But yeah, I wear my sweats and tank tops and t-shirts. I sure do, but I'm still cute when I do it. I'm not bummy in my approach. So in being single, I've learned how to date myself and therefore I know what I want, how I want to be treated, and how I want to be attended to on a date. I'm not cheap to myself, so dot, dot, dot. I don't come out any kind of way, so dot, dot, dot. I don't skimp or undercut myself, so dot, dot, dot. And there are other things that I like for a guy to do, but I dare not say it on here because guys will then just do what they hear on here and then they won't be who they are when they really start to get to know me. But one thing I will say is sitting next to me during lunch or dinner. Breakfast, sit across from me. No clue why, but it's like inviting in the morning. You know what I'm saying? I sit across from me. It's like, oh, the pull. I like that. If, and only if, your breath is fresh, you don't smack when you eat, and you do not talk with food in your mouth. Now, if you do do any of those things, sit catty corner to me. You know what I'm saying? Increase the distance, you dig? Sit over there, and I'm going to sit over here. Because I don't want none of your food particles near my food. I don't want none of your moisture that's in your mouth near my food. So don't sit next to me, and don't sit across from me. Sit catty corner at a six-person table over there. Not here. There. It's just manners, and it's just hygiene. Like, gross, man. The third thing is almost every dude starts to look yummy. Like, listen at me now. Every dude is attractive. It's insane. I know it. I can't help it. But I thank God I recognize that mind. But even recognizing it, I can't help it. It is in freaking sane, man. For example, there's a guy in D.C. There's a guy in Florida. There's a guy in Georgia. There's a guy in Texas. There's a guy in L.A. There's a guy in Maryland. There's a guy in Jersey. Oh, my goodness. There's a guy in North Carolina. There's a guy in South Carolina. And there's a guy in England. Like, what? It's like, he's cute. Wow. And it also used to seem like all of them were brilliant. Used to seem like all of them were brilliant and deep and thought provoking and sweet and whatnot. That is no longer the case. But now to get past the every guy is looking good. Like almost every guy. Seriously, y'all not. Every dude starts looking like a snack. Shoot, forget that. They start looking like a whole friggin' meal. Like it's not the hormones. It's not the pheromones because I'm not near them. It's not. I don't know what it is, but every dude start looking good. And it's not that I'm alone or I need sexy time or anything. It's just now that I haven't really found the mental, emotional, and deeper connection with the dude in so long, the physical is all a sister. God, I'm settling. I'm joking. I refuse to settle. But I'm settling. My eyes are waning, guys. See, what it really is, is that my eyes are now allowed to assess the situation. <laughs> Men in general are sexy as all get out. They just, ooh, it's something about a man and that masculinity. If you are a sperm producing male, your pheromones alone create an attraction. Noticeable or not, there is an attraction. But now, I spy with my single eye. I can actually look at a guy. I can size him up analyze what I'm seeing. See, when you're in a relationship, or at least when I'm in a relationship, I may look at a guy, but I'm not checking him out. I won't let myself. That's what gets you in trouble. That wandering eye leads to wandering thoughts, which leads to wandering curiosity in a relationship. If he isn't everything I'm looking for at the time, then why am I with him? We like to say that it's not the physical that I'm attracted to first, but if you have eyes to see, your first attraction to someone is the physical because that's what you see first. See, it'll determine if a person's going to be a friend or if he's just going to be a, I don't want to call him a friend just yet because something could come about. I used to have a type. Now I don't, which is awesome. This single life has really opened me up to the possibilities. For example, the dude in South Carolina is so cute to me. The dude in Cali and GA, similar body type, height, and meekness. I adore him. The guys in D.C. and Jersey complete opposite body type. The one in DC is actually shorter than the other ones I mentioned. Height? Ooh, 
Height is an attractive quality. It just is. The guys in Texas, Georgia, and England are the same height, very similar height as the guy in D.C. But they're mid-range in the body type. So see, I don't have a type. However, intelligence, drive, conversation, consistency, leadership, a.k.a. decision-making skills, and a giving heart are more important. The physical is what gets you, but the things I just named are what keeps me. And again, I say height is important. That's the physical I'm just never going to not see. Your personality can make up for some of the missings. However, it can't make up for height. Don't shoot the messenger. The fourth bullet I jotted down was portion control. It was kind of random to me too, but I think it sort of makes sense. Look, you by yourself, portion control is very important. So I used to go for multiple people. If nothing else, I cooked for my dude. But most of the time, I was cooking for a significant other. I was cooking for people to come taste food. I was cooking for a gathering. Portion control wasn't important because nothing was going to go to waste. It was all going to get eaten. Now for just me, all I need is half a cup of rice, a quarter cup of grits, half a cup of quinoa, cut up vegetables, and it took some time to get this portion control thing down. I was wasting money left and right. Now, it is rare that something goes to waste, especially my money. It's easy, food-wise, to start with too little, then increase or add to it. And this is why I believe this section is very important, or this point is very important, because I do believe it took me three years to learn that lesson that I just said that everyone probably missed, and I originally missed when thinking about it. But it's easier to start with too little and then increase or add to it. If you start with too much, it's darn near impossible to take it back. It's easier to have too little salt and then add as you go. It's easier to start with too little water and add as you go. I say all that to say this. I was taught that it's okay and dope to start with someone and build the empire. So now when I get to a point of being in a relationship again, I know I just need to add to it. And it shouldn't be a huge adjustment. And I still won't be wasting my money or my time. It's just a simple math problem. Also, (laughs) I have become a much better cook. I love it. I get to experiment. I have different people try different things. Push the envelope like those two times I made octopus. Like there's no limitation. And I know some of you are saying there were no limitations then. Just cook what you want and then cook them something separate. Yeah, that's because you didn't have to do it. It's cuter said than done. Especially when only now you've began to chef it up. Like you're really getting into the cooking thing. Because back then your grandmother cooked for you. Or your sisters cooked. But now... You like this thing you're doing called cooking. So yeah, it's cuter said than done making two people separate meals. Okay, I wish I would have a child talking about they don't want this and I have to make them a different plate. Okay, look, you're going to starve today. I wish my child would come at me trying to be all picky. You better fill up on that water because mommy's not cooking something separate for you, muffin. Unless you're allergic to something, I ain't making it. So I guess my children going to learn how to cook fast if they want to be picky. Now back to the matter. I don't do a microwave or a toaster oven. I don't even own one. So cooking takes time and reheating takes time. Cooking one meal for me and another for someone else is a start at noon, in at six type of thing because I'm not going to shortchange him because he doesn't want what I want. No, I'm cooking an entire meal for him just as this experimental meal I'm making for myself. However, at this point in my life, I am happy to say that I've learned how to make a lot of things and therefore it won't take as long as it once would have. So maybe now I can prepare two meals. Do I want to? No. Am I going to every time? No. Should I have to? No. Another thing that I like about this period is that I can offer meals to other dudes. I want other people's opinions because I want to be able to have some kind of working knowledge of what good meal options could be. Especially if my dude likes something that I've never cooked before. At least I'd have a pretty good working knowledge of what I can make and how to make it. And that's always been the reason I've experimented with different foods, different combinations, seasonings, spices, herbs. It's because, and I'm probably going to offend someone right now and they're going to talk much trash about me, but you'll be okay and as will I. I'm preparing myself to be someone's wife. I'm not preparing myself to be single for the rest of my life. That might be cool for some, but it's not cool with me. I don't want to live in that space because I have no desire to be single for the rest of my life. Shoot, and in all honesty, I don't expect to be single much longer, but in the interim... I'm preparing myself to be what he needs and learn how to prepare what he might want. Do I know what he needs? No, but I know everybody has to eat. But I know that I will be a help. I'm organized. I'm supportive. I'm a cheerleader, etc. And I'll learn more as I grow with him. 
Five, the power, the validity, and the necessity of the word no man. Let me tell you, when you with someone, it is hard to say no, especially if you care about that person. If you love that person, if you have a deep respect for that person, it's harder and harder and as hard as a dick to say no. When you're single and dudes be trying you, you come to a new understanding of what's disrespectful. In a relationship, you do come to your defense. So you aren't paying close attention to what other people are saying. Most times, you do stops before it even starts if he's a good dude and he's paying attention and he's got just six, you know what I'm saying? But when you don't have that protection, that buffer, that arm length in front of you, hey, now back up off of, you see, hear, and feel things differently. Moreover, I realized in my previous relationship, I didn't use the word nearly enough. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going into my next relationship talking about no, 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 uh uh-uh, or thinking with the intent to use the word no, because if we're in a relationship, my answer should be yes. In a relationship, he shouldn't be asking me to do anything disrespectful, so I shouldn't say no. He wouldn't be asking me to do something harmful, out of character, illegal, or disrespectful to him or myself, so my answer shouldn't be no. He's not going to ask me for anything he knows I'm not willing to give, so I should not be using the word no. A good man, he's not going to give me any reason to say no. However, in my last situation, I didn't use the word enough and I had plenty reason to say it. When you use the word no, it sets the parameter for the other person to know what you will and will not do, what you will accept and what you will not accept, what you like and what you do not like. And I did not do that. So he was super disrespectful and was very comfortable in his dirty dealings. Facts. It's no excuse for people to cheat and abuse. But verbally saying the word no lets them know, and more importantly yourself know, what is and isn't tolerated. I shouldn't have to tell you cheating is wrong, but every relationship is different and the line where cheating starts might be different for the next person. But shoot, if you have to sneak around and do it, then clearly you think it's wrong. It's a universal law. Anyone who says cheating is okay or that it's okay under this circumstance or under that circumstance is in essence in an open relationship and doesn't want to admit it. I don't have to tell you putting your hands on me is wrong, but again, universally, we know that. However, I should have said off rip, no. This won't work. Put your hands on me again and I'm effing up your life, your freedom, and your future. All of it. Dead. No is a beautiful word when used honestly, sincerely, respectfully, and in protection of yourself, your family, or the people you care most about. Practice using the word no. It's okay. If someone's feelings are hurt because you said no, then that's their problem. If they're always expecting a yes, that's their problem. I practice on my nieces and my nephew all the time. No. Can I go? No. Auntie can't, no. Auntie Brooke can't, not, no. Practice. Because practice makes confidence. Point six. I have learned who the heck I am. I really have. In the silence of life, in the stillness of reality, in the comfortableness that is being single, I have learned who Brandy Grant is. It's not all skips in the meadow. It's not all dancing in the rain, singing with other bad singers during karaoke. It can be tough. But I thank God for it because I learned very well who Brandy is. Using that silence is golden time to reflect on me and where I failed myself in the past. Not where I failed other people, but where I failed myself in the past. Created an understanding of myself that I appreciate, I long for, I respect, and I'm very proud of. Still, I'm growing and ever changing, but I have a sound foundation. I encourage all of you to really revel in your stillness. Don't think of the negatives that are associated with the term single or the situation, but scoop out those benefits, leave the trash behind and build upon those positives. I mean, who wants to build a house on a sinkhole? Whether it be a slow collapse or a rapid one, that structure that is you is going to cave in unless you build yourself on something solid, strong, and in a place you want to be. I learned what Brandy likes, what Brandy doesn't like, What Brandy will go, what Brandy will not go, what foods Brandy actually does like, the time of day Brandy likes. I've learned so much about myself in these three years of being single. It's crazy and sometimes unbelievable what I didn't know about myself. And in learning me, I have learned how to love me. I have learned how to like me and why I love and like me. And I can without pause say, I love me. 
flaws and all, emotional roller coasters, the ins and outs, the indecisiveness at times. I love Brandy. She is a dope chick. And one day when my him comes along, he's going to see that dopeness and he's going to tell everyone, I got the dopest wife. I have the dopest person living in my house. My rib is the strongest bone in my body. And that's because I've set a foundation for myself that is going to support not only myself, but him, our children, our family, our friends. And then as a unit for the both of us, when we join together, can you imagine if God is molding him like he's molding me? Can you imagine how strong we are going to be together? Oh my goodness. I'm in love with me and I am in love with the person that God is forming and creating and molding for me. Oh my gosh, babe, I'm excited right now if you can't tell. And I'll direct you back to the first point of this show in that silence is okay. I got to reflect. There were times in my past and something would upset me, it would bring me down. I mean in tears because of something. But now... I get to the point where if I'm getting upset or if I'm becoming down or sad or whatever the name of the emotion may be, I will pause, bless God, I'll pause and I'll ask myself, why am I upset? Why are you upset right now, Brandy? I may not answer myself, but it does at least stop me in my tracks from getting any more down. And then I really try to figure it out. And in trying to figure it out, I realize what it is that was about to upset me and I can dead it full stop before it happens. Let me plant this in your mind. A pastor planted it in mine, but let me plant it in yours. What you think about is how you'll feel. Like, please keep that in mind. What you think about is how you'll feel. Whenever you feel that you're about to just fall off a cliff, remember to say that to yourself. What I think about is how I'll feel. And in that moment, change your thought to something that makes you smile or encourages you or something, something that you have control over. Most times, it's the lack of control that bothers us. It's a lack of control that brings us down because we can't make this a positive situation or we can't make this go faster or we can't make it more efficient. It's a lack of control that bothers us the most. So what you think about is how you'll feel. Learn to control your mind and you can learn to control your emotions and your outcomes. It's like, what's bothering me? You guys remember in Family Matters and Carl used to say, three, two, one, one, two, three. What the heck is bothering me? It's the same thing as saying what I think about is how I feel. Over the last three years, I've learned my weaknesses, my strengths, the reasons I do some of the things I do that aren't conducive or beneficial to my life. I'm much better at assessing and preventing those things. I haven't completely overcome some of those things, but I'm still a work in progress. I'm still growing and I'm still learning me. I can be flawed, but so long as I'm still working and striving for a better tomorrow, then I have no complaints about where I am with the love and like of me. I definitely have learned who I am and I have really fallen in love with myself. If you haven't heard episodes three or four about the worst relationship I've been in, go listen to that. If you listen to that episode, you'll see that I neither liked nor loved myself. But these three years have produced a beast. I am so proud of who I am. I know I've said it before and I keep saying it, but I am so proud of myself. I will be better indeed, but because of how I feel about Brandy, my hymn will benefit with some rad rewards. You have to love the person you are first before you can ever get the other things you want to accomplish in life, before you can truly love the person you want to accomplish those things with. Take the time to travel. Write that book. Visit friends and families and hang out, but make sure you do more work on yourself than you try to do on others. Point number seven, and though this is the last in thought, it is indeed by far the most important lesson that I have learned while being single. God is always, 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 just say always an infinite amount of times because he is always there. When I mentioned earlier about my getting down, my getting upset, and I asked myself, why am I upset? I felt like it was actually, or it is actually God asking me why I'm upset. He's keeping me focused and strong. He's giving me a chance to check myself. He's right there to pick me up when he has to, not when I just don't feel like getting up. And I strongly believe he knows those moments. It's not me asking that, but God, he's there asking me, are you really upset right now? And why? What's got you down? What's bringing you down? I want you to go sit down and think or walk around and think, but I need you to think 
and be rational, not reactive emotionally. Why are you upset, Brandy? When I have a good day, God is right there. Average days, rocky days, God is right there. And I know this because I never have bad days. I gave 2019 to God. This is God's year. If I book nothing, if I win nothing, if no reward or accomplishment is given me in 2019, that's fine. Because at the end of 2018, I went to watch night service at church and God clearly said to me, how can it ever be your year if it's never been my year? If you've never given the year to me, how can it ever really be your year? So I gave him 2019 and I said, you can have 2020 if you want. It's yours because he's right. How can I ever have anything if I don't give up anything? It can never be my year if it's not his year. So he stops me before I get there, before I get in the slumps, before I'm depressed, before I'm down and out. When I need someone to comfort me, he does that for me. I don't have a man to do that for me, but God is my man. I'm in relationship with God. He is right there for me. He is right there with me. And he helps me to remain calm and rational Sometimes I do ignore him. I do. And I act irrationally and I am not calm, but he's there. Whether it be a stillness that comes over me, a happy thought that surfaces in my mind, the desire to cook something or watch something that I like on the telly, working on being single in the social media world, he gives me the chance to turn things around. Whatever I might need at that time, my dad might call, my mommy, my love might call, my sisters, my ace might call just to get on my nerves. Oh, oh, he gets on my nerves, but I love that guy. But what I'm saying is, is that God is always sending me things and people to reassure me that he is there. Whether I get married or not, or get into a relationship or not. Again, I am married to God and I'm in an ever-growing, unbreakable relationship. And that takes me back to another episode that I had where I spoke on why a relationship with God is important for my him to have. Look. If I can't incorporate God into my single life, how in the world can I incorporate him into my relationship, into my married life? Hey now, if that wasn't a word for me right there, I'd have messed around and preached to myself. If I can't incorporate him into my life while I'm single, how do I figure it'll be easy peasy to incorporate him into a situation where I now have two people to think about? But if he's already there, if he's already in there, It's both of us walking into this relationship together? Man, please. And God won't have himself in a relationship that is destructive. So if God's going with me into one, it can't be wrong or he'll keep us out of it. I actually need to sew him into the fabric of my single more so that the foundation is set. God is always there. He is constantly and consistently providing for me and protecting me and encouraging me. Man, There was a time when I didn't have checks coming in, when I didn't have any money at all, like nothing, nothing coming in, no money coming in. And I know that money and health are the two biggest stressors in one's life. I had no income, zero, plenty going out, nothing coming in. So I look at my account one day and I'm like, where did that money come from? See, he always taught me about faith. My parents always taught us about faith. And I learned throughout my life that God's calculator doesn't work like my calculator. Mine might not add up. And mine might be in the negative or in the red. But his is always in the black if I do right by him and I do what I'm supposed to do. Though one through six are great lessons, number seven is the best and most beneficial. It cultivated one through six. So that's what I've gathered and enjoyed in being single. I'm still learning myself. I'm still earning myself. I'm still loving myself and I'm still presenting myself to the world. Love me or hate me, I'm me. I'm a work in progress, but I'm me. I will always be a work in progress. I may not be perfect, but I will be perfect for someone. Amen. Violins, please. Being single in a social media world is an adventure, to say the very least. So, Broad News No Fluff presents 
being single in a social media world. That's our episode for the day, everyone. Remember, let's make sure we finished up those housekeeping things. You subscribed to this channel. You've left comments or you're leaving comments on comments, making your original comments. Just make it do what it do, baby. Let me know what you think. Definitely make sure you follow me, Brandy Grant, on Instagram at Brandy with the Y L Grant. That's on IG. And be sure to share this link. Y'all don't understand how much I appreciate y'all because I do, I do, I do. Ooh. If you have any topics that you want to talk about, or you want to hear about, or you want to discuss, then send me a direct message on being single in a social media world on Facebook. Again, that's being single in a social media world. If you miss something, if you know someone that needs to catch something that was said on this episode, you can find this again on YouTube at Raw News No Fluff. On Facebook at both Raw News No Fluff and Being Single in a Social Media World. And on all podcast streaming platforms. Again, I appreciate you all for listening in this week. I look forward to reading your comments. I look forward to talking with you all soon. Talk to you next week.